Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to BAFTA. Um, welcome to the last session of the day, an inclusive industry for all. Um, my name is Robin Gray. I'm the founder of Gaming Magazine. That's Gaming with a Y, which is the world's only LGBTQ video game magazine. I want to just have a really quick whip around the panel and just do some introductions so everyone knows who everyone is. Um, and then we'll get into, they'll get into the hot topic. Um, so we'll start on our immediate left and go around. Awesome. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Danielle. I go by Ebonics as well. Uh, I'm a woman of many roles and talents, um, but you know, some of them are like content creator and DE&I consultant, 3D artist, co-founder of Black Twitch UK, dog mum. Uh, <laughs> but today I come to you as Danny. Um, and I am not having a very good mental health day. My ADHD is going wild today. So and I find it very ironic since it is a mental, a mental health summit. So actually it's quite fitting in some ways. <laughs> but yes, very happy to be here and talking to you all. Hi, I'm Dean Barrett. I'm uh, exec chair at Bastion. Uh, we're a comms agency dedicated to the gaming space. Uh, our clients are Epic Games, Amazon, um, Yuki, Square Enix, Konami, amongst a lot of others, 26 of us in Shoreditch in London. And uh, we do product and corporate comms for people, um, also influencer engagement through our company Pinpoint. Um, and we have a, a network of, of agencies we work with around the, the world called One Voice. Oh, I'm also a chair of a mental health charity uh, called um, Hillside Clubhouse based in Islington. Cool. Um, I'm Nigel. I'm very happy my last name is spelled correctly uh, on there because that doesn't always happen. So I appreciate whoever put together uh, that graphic. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the uh, manga and gaming brand Maya Mada. Uh, I do a lot, but what I don't do is draw. Um, I think that's the easiest way to do it, what I don't do. Um, but yeah, it's a mix of uh, making comics, uh, running gaming events, uh, working with young people across different creative workshops. Uh, outside of that, I'm also on the Mayor's Cultural Leadership Board, uh, giving advice on uh, mostly video games because they have no idea there. And then also on the advisory board of the Children's Media Conference, again, giving advice on video games because they also have no idea there. So that's kind of my role. Um, wonderful. So let me just set the scene. Uh, we're talking about an inclusive industry for all. If we refer back to the 2022 Yuki census, um, there has been an increase in reports of anxiety and depression uh, from the year before. And more importantly, for the uh, purposes of this panel, the report shows that mental health hits diverse talent harder. Uh, junior grades are hit the hardest. LGBT, um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people are hit hard by anxiety versus straight counterparts. Uh, Non-binary people are the most likely to report anxiety and depression, followed by women. And rates of anxiety and depression are much higher among trans people than cis people. So the question is, how can we foster an inclusive industry for all where this amount of mental health issues are such a problem? So in about half an hour, we're going to talk about uh, where we've come from, what's unique about diverse groups, uh, what's being done, and what more can be done. So I'm going to go to Dean first, because I think it's worth reflecting on the progress that's been made to date. Um, so as our, as our industry veteran, um, where have we come from? How has inclusivity and mental health changed over the past 10 years? Um, so I started Basti in 92. And prior to that, I was at Ocean Software, which I'm looking around the room, most of you probably won't have heard of Ocean Software because you're too young, but it was a yeah, few people, thank you. <laughs> um, but then it was like, I suppose, the EA of the day. It was a big, big company. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say it was a, a monoculture. It was lots of white men. All managers were white men, um, and the, the women on the whole were either in marketing roles, where Joe here I work with, but they weren't downstairs making games, and they were in support roles. And I can't tell me, I can't remember any people of colour within that company. At, at the end of that period, and just in case anybody's worrying around why is that middle-aged white man on this particular panel, <laughs> I was a late bloomer, and I was about to come out um, at Ocean, and then <clears throat> started Bastion. And at that time, I kept it quiet for my colleagues at Ocean. And when I started Bastion, I thought the most important thing, personally, was for people not to find out. Because within the industry, there just 
weren't any gay people I knew or identify with. And it was quite a homophobic time at that period. Um, so it has changed a lot. We look around the room and here we are openly talking about this. And we see some people of colour here, but within the industry, nowhere near enough. Mm. And, and that, that is a, a difference. Um, one of uh, my team members ran a D&D &D night for people from LGBT community. And it was amazing, really well subscribed and just um, full of joy, actually, of sort of fascination about that community, but also playing the game. And that the fact that we can do, and it was embraced by Wizards of the Coast, who actually encouraged it, it was great. So that aspect has changed completely. But I think when it comes to diversity, I think we've got a long way to go. Danny, the number of times that, that you've been working in the industry, um, but specifically in the roles that you do uh, related to sort of people of colour. Um, I think Dean touched on it just then about the lack of representation that still exists mm -hmm. in the industry. Why is that? And, and what more are we looking at? And, and how has that progressed at least over the last 10, five to 10 years? Why is that? <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah, we're in 2023 and I still see that there's a, there's a struggle and I wish I could answer the question like wholeheartedly. I still mm. don't understand why that is. Um, you know, one thing that we really do want to see more of is uh, people of colour in like senior roles. So you don't really see people of colour in senior roles calling the shots, making the decision to the final say so's and the higher ups that kind of have the final products like pushed through. So all of these things kind of contribute to why we're not seeing one diverse enough games. Um, but also a diverse enough industry. Um, and I do think that it is changing. So there, there are, you know, games are getting better. We're getting, you know, more and more options, but it's slow mm. and it could be quicker. And I do think that as I have been kind of progressing, so initially I started off with, you know, teaching myself how to 3D model because of the lack of representation. And that's, kind of allowed me to flourish into roles that I've developed myself, which is like being like a freelance DE&I consultant for games and, and game studios. So, you know, as that's happening, I'm saying, okay, so people are actively now wanting to get that consultation happening. They want to make sure that they're doing their game justice. Um, so there is a change and we're seeing it happening, but it's still quite slow. And Nigel, did that sort of reflect on, on your experiences in the industry as well? Yes, I mean, slow progress. Uh, I guess slow progress is still progress. I think from the perspective of like sort of the whys, um, seeing, w working with kids has allowed me to see like different levels. And it comes, a lot of it comes from like just perception of, of who can be in these spaces. Because uh, you mentioned at the beginning about like the monoculture and I feel to a certain extent that's still largely sent, shown as the culture um, sort of en masse. So if you are sort of like, young person, that future generation who, who does have an interest, but you don't necessarily see yourself uh, reflected, it's sort of a, like a subtle thing of this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. So the positive is there are some changes you seen like in terms of like the characters you can play, but then it's the who's making the decisions to produce uh, the games and who's being shown as who can produce uh, the games in those spaces. So, uh, you know, um, we've started a whole campaign. We have a campaign, Do I Look Like a Gamer, aimed at challenging those stereotypes. And it's funny, in a sad way, um, how many sort of young people just like, just assume this isn't for them or, or are actively told that you can't do this mm. at, at certain levels. So it's almost like we're losing a lot of talent uh, very early on. So I think that's part of the why, uh, as well as on the flip side of like who companies or where companies get talent from or think they can get talent from. There's a whole cross section of like, if you're only taking people from university, then it raises the question, who's going to university? And that gets into the sort of socioeconomic factors there that impact on um, sort of diverse intake of uh, future generations. So I think there's, there's many factors. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know we've got uh, like a countdown because <laughs> people need to go. <laughs> we've, but we've got about yeah, payments, yeah. Yeah, there are <laughs> sort of many factors in there. But there's not to say there hasn't been progress as well. Yeah, and I think the sort of the key piece of all of that is that change has been happening and I think that's very positive and it's always good to see there's still a long way to go and the, the speed of it probably needs to pick up substantially. Um, we're obviously at the end of a, a, a mental health uh, day. 
what do you think is some of the most unique impacts uh, on diverse employees from a mental health point of view that, that maybe their uh, cis, white, straight counterparts might not be struggling with? A good example is, obviously, I mentioned earlier, one of the sort of key statistics is one of the, the hardest hit groups, mental health related, uh, is the trans community. Um, transitioning in general is probably one of the most stressful things anyone can do. And I think that then having to do that in the kind of the, the boiler room of an office space where people are kind of, you're on full view and, that's your, and you're going on your journey. Anecdotally, I actually heard that during the pandemic from numerous places that actually people have enjoyed, particularly trans people who are using that opportunity of the sort of the work from home culture to, to go through that transition and, and be their authentic selves more, more naturally because they're, they're not feeling under pressure to kind of have to perform uh, in a kind of like that office space. So I was using that as an example, I was kind of wondering relative to, to your uh, background, if there's anything particular from a mental health point of view if that uh, we might want to share around the impacts of the diverse workforce. Yeah, I just, I think, I don't know about you, but when you are feeling at your best self, you produce the best work. Like yeah. you're, you feel inspired, you feel like you're able to create. And as people in the industry, what you do is you're creating stories, you're creating worlds, you're creating so many different things, but you need to be in a space to be able, a good mental space to be able to create all of those worlds. And then you're sharing this with people who will get encouraged and enlightened and inspired too. So I think in that in itself is one of the most unique outcomes of being able to have a really kind of positive safe space to work to flourish to grow to feel inspired and like, like I said I came in here I, ha I am <laughs> in I wasn't feeling my best self um so kind of like as I was getting ready I was like making my notes and like I was like okay I need to I'm not going to be able to focus today I want to be able to deliver the message that I want to deliver as powerful as I know how but I know I'm not in the best mental place to do so and I know that in past roles, because I used to work in um, a special school for children with autism. I used to work in like social care. And so a lot of like my past roles were very quite intense. And I didn't really have room to be like, hey, I don't really feel that great today. Like I didn't have that space to be like, I'm not having a great day. Mm -hmm. It's always like, buck up, like <laughs> do, do, let your emotions come after you do your nine to five. <laughs> after you do what your job description tells you to do then you can deal with your mental health mm. and <laughs> yeah that's why i left so <laughs> <laughs> yeah that i literally left and was able to do my own thing and that space allowed me to flourish and become ebonics <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so uh, yeah i just think being able to have that space and create the most unique um games and experiences and and network is yeah super essential Awesome. Dean? I think games is an inherently collaborative process. So you work with lots of people that have different skills. So that idea of mixing talents is already within the industry. Mm. We just have to get better at having different types of people within those teams. And I think the, the, the problem or the issues of both diversity and mental health, um, one of the solutions for both of them is that things like this need to happen. But it needs to be whole company solutions. It needs to be everybody partaking in that process, not HR or the CEO mm. or managers. Everybody needs to see that if we are truly diverse and if we look after each other through mental health, we create better products and we create stuff that is more relevant to the communities that we're working for. Um, and so I think companies need to work harder on that. I think that idea that um, it's been mentioned a couple of things that um, uh, I was in today where someone said line managers, for example. Line managers, yes, they're the first contact with somebody who's struggling. But a lot of line managers will feel very uncomfortable about having those conversations. So that idea of training, I mean, not, not the mental health, that's the first aid thing is one thing, but just that signpost. There's a, there's a training course that we're going to put our managers on that's given by mind. And it's just to have that conversation because line managers are focused on getting the work, the job done. But to then say, how are you? But to pick up when that answer mm. comes back that isn't just, oh, okay. Um, James spoke about that today. You know, uh, one of his colleagues, when he was in the NHS, said, how are you? You're not well. So to have the confidence to be able to do that, 
I think is really important. I think we should be pushing the industry to do more of that because we're, we're a stressful industry. We have creative deadlines and, and we can't take that away. So we should be supporting people through that process a lot better than we are. Nigel, what do you think about the impact of the industry on, on the specific sort of mental health of, of diverse people? Yeah, I, I think it goes to that idea. There's like a, a phrase of like, bring your whole self to work. Um, and that is an acknowledgement that that means different things for different people. And it's quite a, when you're in a situation where you feel like you're the only, you know, insert demographic here, um, it's a lot of mental energy to, mm -hmm. to almost be someone else to, to fit in. Um, I think the impact that like games can have is where actually allowing people to be their whole selves, maybe not the whole selves, because sometimes like uh, I think I answer emails in pajamas, but uh, maybe <laughs> not that self, but you know, more of, of who you are. And like to your point about how does, how does that impact the process? Because if we think about video games as that collaborative process that requires input from different perspectives to make a better product, allowing people to, to be different in that space. But apparently that's a difficult thing because <laughs> it is easier to have a monoculture. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier, but it doesn't necessarily result in either a better product or sort of better working conditions or better mental health for uh, everyone. It's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, because mm. if you create a diverse company, A, you're going to make diverse games, but B, you're encouraging people to come to work as themselves. And that, in a sense, will lower the sort of mental health stresses of, of people attending, because they know they can, they can be their authentic self, mm. which sort of seeks quite nicely, because um, one of the things we've been talking about, obviously, is, is some of these kind of like top tips we're starting to see. So I think focusing on... Um, fostering inclusivity, what successes, what, where are the positives, what have we actually legitimately seen either in our own companies or, or in the, the wider industry as saying, this is a really good thing because of X. Um, I'm thinking of um, several studios I've been to over the past couple of years now have started to implement uh, gender neutral bathrooms, for example. Um, there was one um, on the South Bank somewhere that each cubicle had a little uh, sort of vanity basket of, of accessories and bits and bobs that w one might need. And I think that just takes away all the sort of stresses of, of not having to worry about certain things and having to just, again, being a, your true self at work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was just an amazing thing to sort of see as someone that, that's always quite sensitive to those sort of things. Um, so I don't know if anyone's got any good examples, nice takeaways, things that people can learn from. I like when I see that certain companies have like uh, small like cubicles, so they have like breakout rooms. So if you're like me and you get you're quite sensitive to being overstimulated by an environment, and having that breakout room, so you still want to be productive, but you can't be productive because you've got the entire office, mm. things are going off, emails, phones, da -da -da. there's there's so much going on, and you cannot be productive or your best self if you are overstimulated and just unable to engage in the work even though you really want to and so seeing you know uh, buildings that actually have designated areas where it's just a quiet zone um for people who either just want to be able to get on with their work or are just feeling completely overstimulated by the working environment but still want to be a part of the day. Because I, I, I don't like the whole idea of, well, if you're overstimulated, then stay at home. Mm. That's the best place. <laughs> like, no, I, I like to touch grass sometimes. <laughs> I like to be able to say, hey, and close my door and then get on <laughs> with it. Like, and, that's, and, and I want everyone to be okay with that, yeah. you know, because that's what works for me. And I feel like, you know, companies should be able to be like, okay, yeah, that's what works for them. We're going to implement that and make sure that they feel happy to be here with us at their own pace and that's what makes them feel comfortable. I think it's a really important point to actually sort of bring people into the office space but in a way that's comfortable for them. Exactly. Because I think open plan working is is one thing and I've I've certainly been in my fair share of offices that are in open plan where it's either deathly silent because everyone doesn't want to say anything and no one wants to be the one loud person in the office which goes the op I just need a little bit of background noise in my life when I'm working. Same, yeah. like I, otherwise, it just sends me back to school and I'm suddenly in an exam <laughs> room and everyone just, all you can hear is a clock ticking. Um, or the other way, as you say, where, where everyone's having a party, mm. but, but you really just want to focus on this one thing. So I think having those kind of like pods, having those kind of like quieter spaces where you can break out, but maybe still attend meetings, still, mm. be, still be collaborative, still be that kind of... Um, 
rather than just like if you're ill stay at home or if you or if you've got a problem stay at home and it's like that's just that's literally that's that. literally putting you under a rug exactly. <laughs> uh dean uh two things one let's not just be gay in june and black in october Correct. let's mm. do stuff over the whole year yep <laughs> um, and secondly um don't let people my age decide what we're going to do after work for a fun night out mm -hmm. because <laughs> for me it's straight down the bar or a restaurant and, that, and that's fine isn't it and, and no it's not and and so and also when we were doing lots of nights out we realized that they were all quite sporty and that doesn't go down well no. yeah, we went axe throwing but axe throwing there's no drink so that was okay with some that's people but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that's not a good concept. i can see that going <laughs> um, so we we've devolved it down there's a fun group they get to decide and they they take in all voices to, to help decide what those nights are rather than us deciding i think that's important to so mm. feel that people are included in that decision making process yeah i mean i, I think that's kind of uh, some the one thing i've really noticed about the games industry is a bit of an outsider um is is the the drink culture and i think that's kind of a, a legacy almost of the old days um and even in the time that I've been involved in it has led to some fairly catastrophic um, mistakes and, and, and problems and issues and lawsuits and everything else. But um, Can you talk about that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Um, but uh, I, I remember I was at a conference um, out near Wembley. I'm not going to say which one for obvious reasons. Um, but it was an esports thing. And um, the, the, the bar was open at 10 a.m. on a Monday at a yeah. conference. So you can imagine what Monday night was like when we got through to that point, because people had been steaming since lunch. And it's just like, there's a big difference between having a, a, a tipple after work and then going to a conference where you're meant to be doing like your best work and, and trying to be your best. Well, we had a client who, what, I don't think it's a massive secret. We had a client who wanted to start serving beer at 10 o'clock at GDC. And it's like just, just <laughs> slightly behind the curve yeah. Yeah, where we are as an yeah, industry. You know? That's it. Because it's it's not even it's not even a kind of like a I, it, whether people drink or not. I think it's it's that the culture that breeds and the the attitudes that seems to surface and everything mm -hmm. else. Suddenly, it's you end up in a very toxic and intoxicated environment. That whether whether you're you don't want to be part of it for any particular reason or, or whether it's coming back to our sort of mental health topic whether that actually starts to trigger something mm. and, and really sort of starts to stress people out like I, i've got friends that they don't drink because they don't want to drink themselves but they don't mind being around people that drink but if they if it tips over a line and, and people just start to get too drunk it freaks them out mm. and and it's that's their sort of like one of their sort of biggest concerns and mm. i think why should if you're choosing to do that from a sort of um a friendship group on a night out on a Saturday, great, but not Monday morning. <laughs> I feel like it could At also work. deter, like it could really deter people from actually wanting to network. Absolutely. Because I think the, uh, like you said, it's a cultural thing, and a lot of people, from when I remember when I kind of just started getting into the industry and like networking, 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 like that's the key thing. But it is really about we're not networking like, and talking about you know changes and really positive things about the industry. We're drinking and we're having a laugh and that's the best way that we can connect and then we'll email the next week and oh my god that was a great night out wasn't it <laughs> right cool now on to work so i think the expectation is that sadly it's like you have to drink and be a part of you know something that you may not necessarily feel comfortable with in order to make progress or mm. in order to kind of make the connections like an important connections in the industry and yeah it's just not necessary. Well, one of my old jobs before um, before I started gaming was um, working. It wasn't in the games industry, but it was in it was still in marketing and PR. Um, I think to your point, Dean, where you said about the events all being a certain kind of thing, a certain sp mostly sporty, mostly drinky, um, ma mainly for money reasons. When you live in London, you can't really, on a sort of basic wage, you can't really afford too many drinks out. Um, but I sort of used to tap out early. I never used to go. And it, the, the, the word got around that actually I was, it, it came up in a PDP or something in a review that I wasn't engaging. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I just don't like what you do. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's that, it, so it, it was kind of turned back on me as it was my fault and I was the weird one because I didn't want to go out to play darts mm. uh, and drink or I didn't want to go and play ping pong or whatever. That's ridiculous. And, and then like even just, 
being a woman in the industry as no, well. Absolutely. God help us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Help me. Yeah. So it's kind it of very chaotic. It, it comes sort of full circle back to sort of this this conversation that we're having around it's it's the industry is a weird industry anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um being diverse in a weird industry is, is is even weirder. And I think it's kind of like using this opportunity to sort of say that that mental health and diverse people go hand in glove at this point because as we keep saying, a, a, a better industry, a more diverse industry will, will make things better and be more welcoming. And I think that's something that we can keep start taking away from this. Um, Nigel, we're talking about specifically good things to sort of see and do in the industry. What's, is there anything that kind of crossed your mind of, of um, good examples, positive examples, things we can kind of say, yes, that's a really positive thing? Yeah, I think there's... Um an earlier point about sort of different characters, Danny, I think you mentioned like different characters in games because and slow progress. So sort of combining those two thoughts where from what I've seen, having an acknowledgement of like different characters that can add to different perspectives, uh, immediate thing comes to mind is The Last of Us and um, particularly part two and the, the types of characters, types of stories and perspectives. And it's like a slow progress because on the surface, having diverse characters in games is good, but it's not enough. But what it does do is then ask the question, because if you're going to have someone from a particular culture, eventually then it's like, oh, maybe we should speak to someone <laughs> in, that, in that culture. So now you've brought that person in, then you realise, oh, actually there's more mm -hmm. we can learn. Let's bring, so it's kind of a, it's that stepping stone. So I think, again, it's not, for me, it's not enough to have the surface level, here's a different character, but it is a first step into bringing more people into, into the industry. Sometimes it comes from like doing it wrong and, <laughs> and something coming on Twitter and then uh, having to firefight. But if that's what gets to the next step, then um, so be it. <laughs> then so be the it. So be it. So I think that's one of the positive things I've I've seen is like that acknowledgement of needing to get different voices for that authenticity. So if we're going to have different people in the game, we need to make sure we actually speak to those people. And my hope is then the next step is then actually how do we make it a permanent thing of having. Uh, different voices constantly um, coming into our production process. Like one quick example, I was outside of games, but I was consulting on a, um, a, an animated story and it was uh, had diverse characters. And there was a character who was supposed to be from uh, Nigeria called um, Kofi. Uh, I'm oh. from Ghana. Yeah, oh. right. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I, mean, I thought I thought you spot that. So uh, that was a, that was a very easy spot. <laughs> a very easy spot uh, if you're if you're from that area. But having someone in the room who can spot that because that goes out. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. So it's like bringing huh. people into the process. You don't want to be on Niger Twitter getting dragged. At yeah. All. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get dragged. So yeah, I, I think that's one of the positives. It's just that acknowledgement of needing to have different voices. Uh, in the production process, not just at the the end user, the consumer process of here, we made a uh, black character be happy. Mm. That's, that itself is not enough. Talking about recruitment and talking about getting people in the room, what is the recruitment landscape looking like? Are we doing it right? Is there anything we can improve on? Obviously, I know we're going to go with this, and I'm asking a very leading question. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a little bit shambolic at the yeah. minute, isn't it? It's it's quite shambolic and um, I mean I was yeah like I was saying earlier like the senior roles they just are not enough diverse people whether it's a uh, person of colour whether it's someone who identifies as LGBTQ and uh, non-binary I do not see us up there and one we could tackle it by obviously employing people to be in those roles but of course if they don't have the experience because they're always always being put in kind of lower level yeah. roles, then it's kind of like a catch-22. So I was kind of, I was thinking about this earlier actually, and I was like, okay, well, one thing you could do really is invest in the people that are in the lower levels and then w build them up to be able to be in senior levels. Um, because then that way, you know, you're one investing in someone, which is fantastic, yes, like let them level up. Um, and then two, you're actually then putting people who, uh, will be lead diverse voices and kind of can implement change, like really positive change for a diverse wor workforce um, in a higher position. So yeah, it's, it's shambolic right now, but I do think that um, 
hiring people in the senior posts, um, but also investing in the people who do see themselves in those posts is so essential. Because, I mean, we were saying that we, if young people aren't seeing themselves in these roles, they're unlikely to want to pursue those roles, they're unlikely to want to study or, or even just get the experience of being in those roles. So actually putting people in who they identify with in those senior roles can actually inspire uh, a growing workforce to be able to achieve that. And that's actually represented in, this, in the census as mm -hmm. well. There's that amazing sort of cheese wedge of um, diversity in, in the junior grade, and then it really peters out very thinly when it gets up to the top. Um, and you, there's a few pages later, it talks about burnout as well, and you relate back to mental health, mm -hmm. and it's, it's our, our diverse groups of, of people who are burning out quicker. So those junior grades just are not making it to the top because the idea of promoting from within is not working because they don't stay there long enough because you destroy them so quickly. Um, it actually should be recruiting up to those roles, getting people up there because then they can affect change going downwards. Exactly. Um, Dean? If they're not entering, that's, I think, something, two things. I think, again, the, the, the boldness. We need more boldness yep. to go downstream. Yep. We need that very bright young black girl in Leeds to be thinking, yeah, the games industry is where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I don't believe we're, we're touching people young enough in terms of, of m making them aspire to come into our industry. I think we need to be s selling what we do across the board. And secondly, within the industry, certainly in that middle management, we, we need to be bolder to hire people that maybe don't have direct experience, but can bring a whole new mm. set of ideas into the industry. All industries are like this, but I think games industry, there, there is a, a circle of mediocrity going around because I like that phrase. they they used to work at PlayStation, that's right, Xbox yeah. or yeah. EA or whatever. Yeah. And so we'll take them. Gaming you know. Nepo babies. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, yeah. we see it in kind of examples where people have been shuffled off from one organisation because they've been disgraced. And then about a year later, once the NDA clears, they'll, they'll crop up at another company as if nothing's happened. Mm. And it's like you've literally chosen to hire somebody and there's many news articles. <laughs> then it was not hidden away, but you've still gone with that person. Yeah, but it's easy. And it, yeah, there's 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 a lot of those, and and I think it's you, you just look at it and it's like why that makes absolutely no sense. Where you've got a, a catalogue of people that are waiting for their chance, and every, but every single time it just goes to the kind of like the toxic white guy or the toxic whatever that's kind of like oh here we go again at another company. Um, and we, and we want super bright people in this industry. Yeah. Mm. And super bright people who are just leaving university, uh, who certainly are people of colour, they, they're being attracted by the city, mm -hmm. by pharma. You know, they're, they're in high demand. And if we want to attract them, we've got to work a lot harder. Well, I think it's also about going backwards in the, in the, in the, the recruitment workflow as well, because I think getting into more diverse groups to start off with, whether it's getting into um, out making games here in the UK, whether it's um, the Noir Network, whether it's um, Baming Games, um, POC Play, any organization that's out there that has kind of like that, that more diverse pool of people, like go and recruit there. Go and th don't yeah. just stick a job up on Indeed and go, well, that's that sorted. Yeah. Or, or LinkedIn or whatever. It's, it's getting into these spaces to actively choose to go and seek this, this kind of wider pool of talent mm. as well. No, it's it, it's a challenge though because it is it requires more work of course it is and that's why they don't do it and <laughs> why they don't do it but in also i i also wonder if the some of the the progress that's been made is maybe a double-edged sword like for for example there's a lot more like games degrees and games courses mm. and to the point about ease what it does i don't know this for a fact i haven't done the research but uh like Chat we GPT. love a speculation. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm just going to keep going and, and, <laughs> and hopefully something useful will come out. But, um, <laughs> but what it does is it, it says, like, here's the place where you get talent and, and it's done. I don't need to do no work. It's like everyone coming here. But then, like I mentioned earlier, it's like, then who's coming, taking that path? What it requires is, to your earlier point, is like, you need to go and um, engage with different groups that are in different areas. Mm. Like, we've just started this work experience uh, program and there's a few young people and there's one in particular who has said like he doesn't want to go to university, but he's, he's got talent he's, and he's got the, the right attitude like, to develop. It's like, how, how do you get him? Because he could, he could do something, but the system's not quite set up mm. because the system's set up for like, we just look for people who are coming out of university and that's not everyone. So it, just, it requires effort, but also I think uh, it, it requires the, the 
games industry or at least individual companies in the games industry to realize they don't have to do everything because you, no one person can, can do everything. And I think there needs to be maybe more of a collaborative nature at, at different levels. So if you've got you know, larger companies that um, people have heard of, but aren't necessarily in communities where they can get talent, there are uh, smaller companies, and I say this somewhat self-servingly, but uh, there are smaller companies and communities that you've not heard of who, you know, it has, there's yeah. a connection that can be yeah. made. So I think it's taking a more holistic view of like how you solve the problem rather mm. than to be seen to solve the problem and try and do everything that isn't necessarily yeah. always effective. The, um, the, the fascination with, with degrees um, is something that I think is, is like socioeconomically just barriers get thrown up, particularly the cost of, in the current cost of living with the current costs of how degrees are going and everything else. Like, do you really need a degree to do that job or is there more practical apprenticeships, hands-on training mm. that people can actually get into? And that might freshen up the workforce and, and bring in more sort of diverse people that way as well because the, 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 the almost near insistence that every grade in the games industry now has to have a degree of some description, it yeah. just, it, it's just going to end up sort of whether it's whitewashing literally or whether it's washing it in terms of economics or, or anything else, it's mm -hmm. just going to cause a, a certain group of people to always be near the front of the queue because they're the ones This is a degrees. whole different afternoon you could do. But oh, about totally, 10 yeah. years ago, I did a piece of work for PlayStation where we looked at all the master's degrees that had game something mm. in there, game design, game whatever, 110. The, the team inside, I, I got all the projectors together and sort of raised them and everything. They decided that only two of them they would consider hiring people from that class, and the rest of them they wouldn't touch them because they they just wouldn't have the the right skills yeah. to come into the workplace. I mean, someone just, we need to put a microscope under what's going on there because these yeah. are people who have paid for that, yeah. paid to go and have that course, and yeah. they you look at the perspectives it's saying you will get a job in the industry. And that's only saying mm. wouldn't touch them. That's so bad. I just I think it's the gaming industry needs to understand that skills are generalizable and that you can use them pretty much in whatever capacity needed. Like, I haven't had a job for a long time, but my CV is packed, <laughs> okay? My CV is packed because I have picked up so many skills from streaming, from speaking, from designing my own stuff. Like, that's why I said I'm a woman of many jobs mm. because there are, me there are so many things that have gone into what happens in the gaming industry now and when I think about, so like there's a couple of people who are in the Black Twitch UK community who not, not at in the slightest had any gaming experience, went to uni for games, but are now working in the gaming industry because they have skills that are generalizable mm -hmm. and transferable. And I, I said my heart sings because you just don't, seeing more like black firms and just like black individuals in general work in the gaming space because it makes you feel like okay i don't have to fight as hard to get in i don't have to fight as hard or or try and like the side words and or th there's so there's so much relief seeing more people who look like you working in the space but also knowing that they didn't have to go through the whole uni process and praying and hoping that they get a job in the industry is because simply because they had the skills that are transferable that we now actually have yeah. prop like at proper representation in the space and good representation and people who actually know what they're doing and are passionate about it. It's more yeah, exactly. of it. More exactly. of it. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so just really quickly then, um, what what does the future look like? That's not a quick question, but. <laughs> Let's go again. Um, <laughs> but, but realistically, what, what could, in, in a, literally a couple of words, what can people take from this brief overview back to the workplaces, back to their lives in general, back to other companies and just sort of say, do more of this? So for me, it's recruitment and wider recruitment. Um, Nigel? Um, I'd say dialogue. Uh, I think Dean touched on it earlier. I think having different people in requires you to actually talk to the people and not assuming that they're all one and the same. So I'd say uh, dialogue. Cool. Danny? Um, one size does not fit all. What works for one person does not work for the other. And allow people to come to work as their whole selves and not feel like if they are having a poor mental health day that they can't, they are not allowed to perform or they aren't mm. allowed to be there or they're not welcomed to be there because they're not feeling their best self and actually finding out what works for them and work with them on that because it is a collaborative effort. 
It's both those two. I think it's 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 a whole company effort, and everybody celebrating everybody else and bringing together their best selves to then create brilliant games because we've got different voices around the table, and. It, this is just an amazing industry to be in. The mm. stuff that comes out of this industry is truly fantastic. It just needs more different types of people taking part. And that means that everybody in the company should be saying that, not just mm. HR or management. Yeah. It's a really great place to finish, I think. Um, everyone, please get up for this panel. We've got Nigel, we've got Dean, we've got Danny. Um, So um, thank you for, for attending this panel. Um, it is the last panel of the day. So also um, thank you for attending this whole summit. Um, thank you to Safe in Our World. Thank you to BAFTA. Um, it's, it's a really, really important message. Um, and I'm super proud to even be a little bit part of it and, and kind of sharing this and really sort of starting this conversation because we shouldn't be shy about talking about mental health. Um, thanks also to uh, sponsors, uh, Bastion, PlayStation, and Ripstone. Uh, that is it for the entire day. I've been reliably informed that there will be casual drinks uh, at the Red Lion, which is back there somewhere. So we're really living the values that we just talked about, about, <laughs> about not drinking in the industry. But there you go. We can have a lemonade. Yeah. We can have a lemonade or, or a, sti a stiff We're having water pimp. as a collective. Water all around. Yeah. My Collaborative treat. water. My treat. <laughs> um, thank you all. Thank you.